presentation, so I was given the, this title, Avoiding an Unwanted Post-Antibiotic Era, Establishing and Building Efficacy as a Global uh, Public Good. And so I decided to uh, look at it from four perspectives. I will briefly summarize the burden, and, and I might be repeating what has been said uh, already this morning. I will talk then about the drivers, um, the challenges, and then finally, let's look at uh, uh, solutions, or at least some of the solutions to address um, antibiotics as a, a global public good. So let me start with the burden. Uh, you're all familiar with the, uh, this report and with the figures published in this report and the estimates of the burden of antibiotic resistance. So I, I won't, I won't uh, uh, dwell on this. Um, I just wanted to sh introduce this slide because I, I wanted to briefly discuss this slide about that's attributable to antimicrobial resistance um, by 2050, but then looking at the different region, regions. And, and this report suggested that the biggest concern of the impact on, of AMR on morbidity and mortality is in Asia and also in uh, Africa. And that's an introduction to my next slide. Uh, our uh, paper published last month in PNAS, where we looked at antibiotic consumption rate by country in 2015 in DDDs per thousand inhabitants per day. It's one way of looking at antibiotic consumption. I know it's not ideal, but it's one way of looking at it. And it showed that you have a huge variation, obviously. And the winner of that study was uh, Turkey. And, and if I say the loser was uh, you know, some of the other countries, the other part of the, of the, uh, the, uh, the other side of the, of the uh, figure. Uh, but but um, Although you can still see that antibiotic use is, is particularly high in high-income countries, what we also showed in this paper that if you look at the change in the national cons antibiotic consumption rate between 2000 and 2015, again in these per thousand inhabitants per day, you can see that there's particularly a very dramatic let's say, increase uh, again in, uh, in, in Asia, uh, but also in, in Central uh, and, and particularly in South America. And so, this is where we can expect um, the biggest uh, selective uh, drive or the, the biggest selective pressure and, and perhaps even more problems in, in over the next maybe 10 to 15 years. And so what drives an antibiotic resistance? And I think that if you talk about drivers, there are uh, uh, three ways uh, of, of, of let's say, uh, explaining the emergence of antibiotic resistance. The first one is, of course, uh, selection. And this is a study that we did many years back, um, and it was actually the first ever double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial, uh, looking at the impact of antibiotic uh, use on selection of resistance. And we did this study because I was part of the discussion on the, on the banning of the growth of motors in, in Europe. And there was a discussion at the court in Luxembourg um, um, about whether there's evidence to ban growth of motors um, and whether there's enough evidence that antibiotic use selects for resistance. And surprisingly enough, at that time, there wasn't that much evidence. It was all very circumstantial. So that's why we did this double by placebo control trial. And, and basically, um, and you can go back to the paper if you're interested, but basically it showed that if you, if you take healthy volunteers, and these were medical students, biomedical students, and our faculty in medicine, and if you look at the proportion of macular resistance to aptococci, these were, I don't know if this works, well, maybe not. These were around 30%, so on average, 30% of streptococci in normal population uh, are resistant to macrolides. And if you then expose them to a macrolide, you see that within 24 hours, most of the streptococci are resistant to, uh, 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 to uh, these macrolides. And if you give a placebo, you see nothing. So that was a very strong evidence that macrolides, at least in this study, were the strongest uh, driver of, of uh, antibiotic selective pressure uh, and, and, and of emergence of resistance. The second is, of course, horizontal gene transfer. Bacteria behave like humans, they like sex, and so this is what bacteria do a lot, and they exchange a lot of genes, and that's what we call the sex canal, uh, through which, uh, which they will exchange uh, genes uh, maybe coding for resistance. And that's something that we particularly see in gram negative bacteria. So, horizontal gene transfer is another very effective way of, of spreading resistance. And I just wanted to give you one example of uh, Greece, where it's impressive to see the spread of a particular clone, and I'll come back to this, accumulating a large number of resistant genes. The ESBL coding genes, carbapenemase coding genes, and if you look at these strains, it's just amazing how many different genes you could find in these strains 
coding for uh, different mechanisms of antibiotic resistance. So that's, of course, through the uh, uh, horizontal gene transfer. And then the third mechanism is spread. Um, and, and that's particularly where we see a problem with the gram-negative bacteria. And I want to give you two examples of spreads, a global spread of uh, resistance uh, of, the, of very successful clones. And the first example is the global dissemination of the combination of CTXM15, that's an ESBL um, um, enzyme, uh, in an E. coli uh, SD131 uh, clone. And it's actually remarkable, and it's not always very clear why these clones have been so successful globally, but it's remarkable that this clone started spreading around 2007 and 2008, and then has spread globally, and now is, is present in, in, in all parts, all regions of the world. And this morning there was a discussion about raising awareness. That makes it, of course, very challenging, because um, these clones spread globally. So if you like, it's a pandemic disease, it's a pandemic spread. Just like flu is a pandemic disease, that's the same for antibiotic resistance. Only with flu, it will spread over a period of one to two years and has an enormous impact on, on, on public health, on population, on the economy, etc. Whereas for antibiotic resistance, of course, it takes two to three decades before you actually see that it really becomes a problem. And that makes it very challenging to raise awareness among, among the public, for instance. And that's the second example of a pandemic uh, a spread of a particular clone, SD258 of cluster pneumonia. And again, it's remarkable how this clone has spread over the last 20, 25 years. Not always clear why this clone has been so successful, but again, I would like to re-emphasize, and, and this is what the quote from, from Mark Osterholm's book, that there are basically only two infectious disease situations that can be considered inevitable serious pandemic threats. The first one is, of course, influenza, but the second is uh, antimicrobial resistance. And I think people are not aware of the fact that antimicrobial resistance is indeed a pandemic spread of uh, some of these very successful clones. And again, it's not always clear why they are so successful, but it is remarkable. So what are the challenges? Well, again, it's been discussed this morning, this afternoon. First of all, discovery of novel antibiotics is not keeping pace. Um, and um, particularly for, the, for uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the last 30 to 40 years, uh, there has been a gap in developing new antibiotics, and particularly for the gram negatives, we see a major challenge, and, and, and it is indeed very difficult, to, uh, particularly for gram negative antibiotic, uh, for to produce antibiotics against the gram negative bacteria. So that that is is a major um, uh, challenge. The second challenge is uh, um, the fact that that development of antibiotics is lengthy, it's risky, and it's costly, and this is nicely shown in this figure particularly referring to the value of death in the uh, hit to lead and lead optimization in the preclinical phase of research and development, where very few compact uh, bonds will effect effectively make it and, and will lead to registration. So it's a very risky business for pharma uh, to develop uh, new antibiotics. I just wanted to say a few words about diagnostics. Um, it's not entirely the same, but, but there are some similarities. Um, between the economic model that's broken for antibiotics and also uh, 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 for diagnostics. Because although we, 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 we do have a tsunami of diagnostic instruments and fantastic technologies that are uh, available or that will become available for detection, for rapid detection of its respiratory uh, pathogens, it is a challenge um, to uh, use these diagnostic tests. Because it would be fantastic if we could use these rapid diagnostic tests in the GP's office and if within a few minutes the GP could tell the patient that he has a virus, he has a virus, he has a virus, he has a virus, and therefore antibiotics are not needed. However, the problem is, and again this was discussed this morning, the problem is, and this is a quote from the Wall Street Journal, about um, uh, the value of diagnostics versus the cost of antibiotics. And I'll just read this quote to you. So, as a doctor, I can either prescribe $4 penicillin on the chance that the patient has a strep infection, Dr. Paisley says, or he can order a $51 strep test to make certain the person does. And for a patient struggling to make ends meet financially, he says he prefers a $4 penicillin. So that's, of course, also where we have a problem uh, with, with diagnostics, because these tests, they are, they are expensive, they're expensive to develop, and yet they're not uh, adequately reimbursed. So the current economic model is, is uh, broken. Um, and of course, what we would love to see as new antibiotics, 
And then the first thing we would do, and I would certainly do as someone who works in the public sector, I would really thank this pharmaceutical company and say, this is a fantastic thing that you have achieved, and now we're not going to use an antibiotic because we want to preserve it. And of course, no, no company would want to develop a drug if we would tell them afterwards that we're not going to use that drug, and certainly it, the, uh, it would not be as in the past, that the benefits would be driven by volume of sales. But of course, from a stewardship perspective, this is completely irrational, and it makes, of course, a lot of sense that we don't uh, do, make the same mistake as we have done in the past. But from an economic perspective, this is a financial loss, and many studies have shown that financially it's not rational to uh, turn to, to, to develop antibiotics. So the problem is that the current paper use model reimburses for only a piece of the value, and that is, of course, very challenging, and there have been lots of solutions, or suggestions for solutions for that, and I'll come back to this. So this is uh, uh, something that John Rex has been discussing a lot about, the fact that antibiotics, they go beyond the simple use and have a much broader value. And he used to compare this with the fire extinguisher. But they have different values, and he just summarizes three values. One is enabling value. For instance, for uh, uh, surgical prophylaxis or for medical uh, procedures, you really need very effective antibiotics uh, to prevent infections. Um, for uh, um, it, it's also important uh, to have new antibiotics available in case we see emergence of resistance. So again, we may not necessarily want to use these antibiotics, but they are certainly are an insurance for the future if we do see emergence of, of, of uh, resistant bacteria. And then the, the last value uh, is a diversity value, where if you have multiple antibiotics, they may reduce the pressure and delay resistance on the other antibiotics. So that's why. Antibiotics and again, for that matter, diagnostics, they rep represent a value. And the value is not only for the patients, but the value is also for the healthcare system and for the society, and this is also global. And therefore, antibiotics and their efficacy are indeed a, a global uh, public good, and we unanimously agreed on that in our discussion this afternoon. So let me finish now with, with uh, the solutions. Well, I'd like to first share a few, a few slides from the Drive AB project. This was a project funded by IMI, looking at the uh, business model for developing new antibiotics. And here they propose a number of um, initiatives, um, let's say a combination of um, a push and a pull initiatives um, through the different phases of research and development. Talking about grants, pipeline coordinators, market entry awards, and also about uh, continuity. And I'll just discuss briefly grants and market entry awards, and again, uh, reward, this uh, report is publicly available, so I, if you're interested, I, I would invite you to read uh, this uh, very nice report. And I know there's been a lot of discussions uh, in DriveVB about uh, reaching an agreement between the public and the private the sector, part of this uh, consortium, about these uh, initiatives and these recommendations. But this is just an overview, again, in the DriveVB slide, on the, of the different grants as part of these different initiatives um, within, it, uh, uh, let's say, uh, different R&D uh, phases. And I, I wanted to share this slide with you just to give you a breadth of the many global initiatives to support research and development. There's GPIEMR, there's IMI New Drugs for Bad Bugs in the Rise in 2020 course, there's BARDA, there's NIH and IEID, the Wellcome Trust, National Science Research Agencies, and then some recent initiatives discussed also by my email this morning, um, um, and there's also uh, uh, some other initiatives such as the Carbix, uh, European Investment Bank, uh, UK China Global Innovation Fund, and there's certainly others that, that have been launched, or that will be launched very soon. So the many global initiatives, and that is of course uh, great, but I do have a concern about duplication of some of the efforts and some of the funding uh, through these different initiatives. And again, I think it's also clear that there's particularly a lot of investment in let's say, uh, early stage um, uh, push mechanisms, uh, particularly, uh, 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 let's say, uh, basic research or preclinical research, and perhaps less so in the late stage um, uh, uh, push initiatives and also certainly in the uh, uh, pull initiatives. So just a one slide about the pull initiatives. is again, uh, um, uh, initial, let's say, a solutions proposed by the Drive B Consortium proposing to provide market entry reward. And again, I will not discuss the mechanism. This is, again, what's published, uh, discussed in the report that there are several ways of rewarding a company entering uh, an, an antibiotic in the market, um, either fully delinked or, let's say, partially delinked, where uh, uh, the revenues are partially based on the reward, but also on, on the volumes of sales. So then there was a lot of discussion in this report, but also uh, in other uh, organizations, 
how much funding is needed if you want to uh, create a global fund to support these rewards, or perhaps other initiatives, how much funding is needed. And in that particular report, we talk about, let's say, $1 billion per year, um, roughly, um, whereas in other reports, they mention something like uh, 20 to $30 billion over the next 10 years uh, if you want to um, develop this global fund and support some of these um, um, initiatives, uh, or let's say pull initiatives uh, for new antibiotics into the market. So one, this, this is one way of addressing this from a public a health and a private a global perspective. The second, I think, is a second solution could be the building of clinical trial networks. And this is, this is what I would call a late stage uh, push initiative. Um, um, and you can see a lot of uh, uh, global initiatives now to develop a global trial networks. It's, it's emerging very slowly, uh, a bit like antibiotic resistance, but hopefully a bit faster than antibiotic resistance. <laughs> Um, but it is, it is, you could see it in different parts of the world where um, uh, people are building this uh, global uh, this clinical trial network. So there's the ARG, and ARG is acronym for Antibiotic Resistant Leadership Group. It's funded through uh, um, an IID in the United States. It ex it, the funding expires in 2019, but I think there are discussions now to extend ARLG until 2025. Um, and that would of course be great because that is a, a, a clinical trial network that they are building in the United States with also some global outreach. GARP is also, as, as Manika was mentioned this morning, supporting clinical trials, particularly in the sepsis trial, where they are also hoping to establish something sustainable for uh, uh, studies or clinical trials in, in neonates or pediatrics. Um, and then Wacom Trust is also interested in supporting some of these clinical trial networks and Wacom Trust is particularly interested in, in the uh, war, is supporting war-based trials and has published a, a, a recently a request for proposals. Um, so that's another organization that is particularly interested in clinical trial networks. And then I would uh, uh, like to end with, uh, with uh, uh, Europe and, and the combat of innovative medicines initiatives where we have also been uh, working very hard on building clinical trials um, and I think this has come through the um, um, support of the public and the private sector because there is indeed a lot of support for that. There was the roadmap published by the industry in September 2016. There was a G7 health ministers that uh, communicate again uh, both of them su supporting what is encouraging governments and the private sector to uh, establish these global uh, clinical trial uh, studies networks. So for instance in Europe we have um, received a lot of funding from Innovative Medicines Initiative. This is uh, one of the largest uh, public health, uh, let's say, uh, uh, large health uh, public-private uh, initiatives, um, where we have been conducting many, many trials, epidemiological studies, randomized controlled trials, adaptive platform uh, uh, trials, um, through combat net, combat care, combat magnet, combat CDI, and you can see the number of patients that have been included since 2011. Uh, and it's also nice, to, for instance, to, to, to see that, um, that companies like Shiodogi and Merck have contacted us to help them with selecting and training sites, not only in Europe, but also globally. And I think that's great. So that is probably, a, hopefully, a way to uh, run these uh, trials much faster, but also to reduce the cost of these clinical trials because they are indeed challenging trials and they are also very, uh, very expensive. And what is nice is, is the fact that uh, that there is a more and more collaboration now between these other initiatives. And for instance, a few weeks back we had a meeting with uh, people from ARRG and we agreed in a on a memorandum of understanding to collaborate and see whether we could do these trials together um, and, and also use our, uh, have some of our global sites again to, to run these trials together. So I think bottom up a lot of things are happening and particularly with regards to clinical trial networks, this, uh, this will further grow. And so, Building these sustainable clinical trial networks, I think, provides really unique opportunities. It will hopefully uh, become an incentive to pharma to invest in that discovery. But the nice thing is that you can also broaden this. Once you have your clinical trial network, you can broaden this to other antimicrobial drugs. You can broaden this to vaccines. You can broaden this to antivirals, to antifungals, and most important, very importantly, and that's what we're hoping to do uh, the next uh, four or five years or so. You can also build a network, particularly for running clinical trials with new diagnostic tests. Allows to investigate different trials, allows new models of clinical trials. As I said, um, uh, we try to develop adaptive platform trials in Europe uh, for, uh, for drugs, but also for uh, diagnostics. 
it certainly creates innovation of the public but also the private sector, particularly it would be great support for the SMEs and then most importantly it would result in improving quality of care delivered uh, to our patients. So finally, if you look at the solution they are adopting, and, and, and I won't discuss the interaction between the, let's say, let's say human sector and, and between animals and, 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 the, and the role of and these animals and the role of water, etc. But it is, it is very daunting. And it would take me half an hour to explain it, how antimicrobial resistance spreads through the different ecosystems. And therefore, I think we really need international political uh, initiatives. And there are many, many, many uh, political initiatives. I will not discuss them, of course. But I will only discuss the very first one, um, the United Nations General Assembly and the, um, the Interagency Coordination Group that has been funded. And I, I think you're all familiar with this uh, initiative um, where we have, um, I believe, 13 organizations and 14 experts that are part of uh, this uh, Interagency Coordination uh, Group. So, great expectations. I don't know whether they will actually fulfill these expectations because as, as I assume that they will have to report next week to the, uh, to the U, uh, UN General Assembly. But very, there are great expectations indeed, um, but certainly uh, I think what is, what is needed to address this antibiotics as a global uh, public good is to develop such a, uh, such a uh, uniform and, and global initiative um, to, uh, uh, to support this. But I think that these solutions um, should also be accompanied by public health policies ensuring two things. First, uh, sustainability of antibiotic use. And there are very few initiatives that are doing that. I think GARP is one of them, and I think that's great. That this is part of the, let's say, the, the mission statement of GARP. So that's very important. We have to ensure that, that we can continue to use antibiotics and preserve them. And second, of course, is patient access. And again, this was just discussed this morning. This morning that in some countries, access is more of a problem than, than access of antibiotics. So I thank you for your attention.